Before Galileo, popular wisdom decreed that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Now we know that we're at the edge of our galaxy, a rotating spiral of hundreds of billions of suns like our own, each with the possibility of having planets that could sustain life. But if there is life, what chance is there of it being like ours? We only built the first internal combustion engine about a century ago. Is it possible that an alien civilization has managed to cross the vastness of the galaxy to our planet? Some say there's evidence that they have. Our first story tonight takes us to an area of Scotland which has become known as the Falkirk Triangle. West Lothian, a small industrial region in central Scotland. The locals are a down-to-earth breed, not the sort you'd expect to spin tall tales and leave themselves open to ridicule. But their community has been gripped by a most unearthly phenomenon. Hey, look, look, it's a UFO. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get a focus. Stand a bit, do it. As I started underneath the craft, it dropped like a shimmering curtain of light. I want the Ministry of Defence to send somebody in here now and give the people an answer. Councillor Billy Buchanan is a popular local figure who's championed many causes, gaining a reputation as a man of the people. But even he was stunned when locals came to him with stories of strange objects in the skies. Yes. Well, I started in 1992. I received a, a knock at the door one evening and there was a friend of mine who I've known for a number of years. He told me that he had an encounter in the back roads of Bonnie Bridge. He couldn't describe the format of it because the light was too intense, but it was hovering above the road, it was soundless, and he watched it for 10 minutes and it moved off at incredible speed. I put a small uh, news item in the local newspaper and uh, that's when it began. This thing just appeared out in, in, in a farmer's field and it was jumbo jet size. Really luminous, bright, you know, objects. Just sitting there, I, I mean, I was terrified. Red. Look right at the top, clear lights in the middle and blue lights at the bottom and they were all spinning. From there the whole thing just snowballed. We had hundreds of people coming to the office or phoning us up to say we've seen things as well and it became a sort of national story. In the first week I think I had about 400 to 450 either telephoning or coming to my door telling me that they had seen something. One of the local residents keeping watch and logging claims of sightings was UFO researcher Malcolm Robinson. Our society um, checked through various avenues open to us to provide a rational explanation to account for these UFO sightings. We checked firstly with uh, the police. We also checked through um, various airports. Then we also checked with uh, meteorological stations to see if there were release of any weather balloons that may have overflown the area. And lastly, we checked through the Ministry of Defence to see if there were any aircraft manoeuvres. Once we have checked through all avenues open to us and we cannot find a rational explanation to account for a given sighting, then obviously that uh, particular sighting must be classed as an unidentified flying object. The intensity of sightings is, is unbelievable. People call this the sort of Falkirk Triangle. On July the 30th, 1994, Andy Swan, a 27-year-old cable layer with Scottish power, had what he says was a close encounter. We went up to the, the park to have a, a look at a, a lightning storm that we were having that night. I noticed this object heading towards the, the school building. I was uh, intending to come along and have a better look at this object from behind. Uh, as I was travelling along the road, I seen this object coming from the left-hand side. It came down so low, right in front of the car, so close that I thought I was going to hit it. And I had to put my brakes on hard to avoid it. And I go out of the car, and I watched this thing just coming over the top of me, where it just landed just above the field. This thing just suddenly, it just like a bug, it just shot up right across the top of me. Author Stuart Campbell believe such sightings are merely tricks of the light. The atmosphere is capable of producing suffusing mystical effects of varying types, and almost anything can be believed of the shape of such objects, starting with an astronomical object, a planet or a bright star. Very many of the distortions that cause uh, people to see a UFO out of an astronomical object is the temperature inversion. This occurs when a layer of hot air becomes trapped under a layer of cold. Just as you see a mirage on a hot road in the summer, you can get a mirage in the sky due to these effects. 
Tricks of the light or alien spacecraft, whatever they were, more and more UFOs were being reported all over central Scotland. We headed out about 10 o'clock, just chatting away about general things. What you said your radio was it, man. Tune it in, will you? We went around just this bend and the road heading towards Starbrax. Something caught my eye just above the line of the, the top of the windscreen. What the hell's that? Hmm? Nothing there. I never ever seen anything like it in, in my life. It was black in colour. It was like shiny. It had three parts to it. It, it was circular. I really panicked. I just, I didn't know what to do. Gary, for God's sake, drive! Drive through! As I started going underneath the craft, it dropped like a shimmering curtain of light. And I like braced myself. As I went underneath it, the whole road and surrounding the area just completely disappeared. I'm like it's some unavoided blackness. I didn't know where I am. I had the sensation that the car was lifting. Because I know for a fact the wheels weren't turning. I mean, there was no traction. All of a sudden, it was just a big burst of bright light. The car sort of kind of like slammed onto the road. Gary, for God's sake, drive! Go, go! And I ran to Katrina's house and I was banging like mad on the door. Gary was hysterical. He knows I've got four kids. There is no way that he is going to come to my door, pound on it, push me right out the road and enter the way he did. Something dramatically happened to him. He was blown. They say the journey should only have taken 30 minutes, but took two hours. So how could they account for the lost time? I'm an hour and a half missing out my life and I don't know how or why. Gary and Colin turned to regression therapist Helen Walters, hoping she might hold the key to explaining what happened on the road to Tarbrax. Hypnotic regression helps you recall the incident that you take them back to at around that time. And it brings to light what their problem is, to be able to handle it in their daily life and remove some of the fear. Dark! <laughs> I just saw this thing coming towards me, these things. Okay. And I was just terrified. What can you see? Men. And all I remember is just pure fear, absolute terror. Can you see something, Colin? It's near my face. I mean, the next thing I can remember was like... Don't want it near! Some kind of instrument coming down from my right hand side. Away! With a long, long, thin needle went straight into the centre of my eye. Away! Even under hypnosis, you could see my eye was pouring with water. Could this be a genuine memory? And could the claimed abduction account for the missing two hours? Hypnosis has been used many times to discover what people went through in some UFO experience. Unfortunately, hypnosis is a dangerous and flawed technique. People are regressed to the events that they think happened to them, but unfortunately, hypnosis is rather prone to produce fantasy more than fact. And so fictitious tales emerge. The story had a galvanizing effect on local opinion. It seemed everyone had a UFO story to tell. Well, I just saw this bright light. I thought it was a helicopter at first, and I just kept, and then Oh, yeah, suddenly I says, oh, Barry, there's a UFO. They're talking Barry, I'm telling you, that is a UFO. I'm serious, that's a UFO. It's a light. Barry, that is a UFO. When he wanted to pull over, I says, no, just keep going. <laughs> he says, no, we'll pull over. We ran out to the back of the vehicle, opened the boot up, and the camcorder was lying there. So I dived in and I grabbed it. I was trying to zoom it in and whatever, it was, yeah, then I lost it. Look at the colours. Of course it is. Trying to clear picture of it so people would believe me if I had it on evidence or tape. It started off like around football, really bright, sort of tilted, went to its side, like a saucer shape. It was all a matter about, I'd say about three, four hundred yards away. It was just like above the rooftops, kind of the houses and then all of a sudden it just disappeared. For Billy Buchanan, this image, along with the other photographic evidence, was proof enough to take the fight for an investigation to the highest level. Earlier approaches to the then Prime Minister, John Major, and the MOD had been rebuffed for what the government saw as a lack of evidence. We've had numerous videos, numerous photographs. We've had all these people that's came forward and given us their accounts of what they've seen. And that's no tangible 
What do they need? Do they need some sort of flying saucer or something to land in the middle of Bonnie Bridge? Me and Colin, in a court of law, we would be taken as two good witnesses. But because it's such a, a subject like this, it's looked on as if we're mentally disturbed or something else, and it's just no fair. We're only looking for answers like everybody else, nothing else. What we are dealing with are low-level, close proximity UFO sightings, sightings above cars, above rooftops, and if that's not a threat to national security, then we don't know what is. I'm writing a letter at this moment to Tony Blair, the new Prime Minister. I'm saying, you get in here and give us an explanation. Now, it might be a logical explanation or a rational explanation, but we demand an answer. So far, Councillor Buchanan's extraordinary request for a government inquiry hasn't been taken up. Meanwhile, in the Falkirk Triangle, residents report that the number of alien visitors is still increasing. But then, of course, that includes the English tourists who've come up to see what all the fuss is about. Up until the 13th century, bears roamed the British countryside. They were dangerous beasts and would quite cheerfully maul people to death. The wild boar was another feared animal, capable of the odd disembowelment. By the 17th century, both species had been hunted to extinction. Today, with its pretty villages and ordered patchwork of fields, we like to think of the British countryside as a safe and gentle place. But could it be that a wild and savage beast still stalks the dales of Durham? They're locking up with extra care in Durham these days, since a mystery visitor first began to disturb their peace. It happened so quick as I went up to it, it stood up, turned around and went into the hedgerow. When it was very early, there was no other traffic about. It was, that's exactly what it is, just got up, turned around and went. As a local farmer, Heather Allenson knows the usual animals of the region well, but this, she says, was something different. We have dogs and cats on the farm, obviously, and animals. We see deers, badgers, and it was nothing I've ever seen before. What struck me about it was its very shiny, glossy head, its features. It had big, bright eyes, and just the power of it as it got up and went. We've had about 180 sightings to date. Some of them have been very, very good sightings, sightings by doctors of biology, by countrymen, who you would expect to be able to recognise anything that you see in a countryside. Sergeant Eddie Bell is Durham Police's wildlife officer. He's been on the case of the mystery sightings since they began over 10 years ago. Mobile phone, she's up at the oh, A68. Sorry. There's been a fox cub knocked well, down, now it's injured. Too was something different to what people would normally see or, or they wouldn't have reported it. But we, we hadn't a clue really what it, it could have been. It was, I suppose, mystical really. One of the earliest sightings was made by lorry driver Robert Davis. His encounter happened at Fishburn Cokeworks in 1986. It looked about five to six feet, maybe it's a bit less. It was sandy coloured. And it had a dark sort of like front, maybe it's off the coke dust. And it, it just walked light. Fishburne Coke Works, now closed, provided Eddie Bell with the first clue as to the identity of his quarry. It appeared that the beast had jumped a 10 foot coke heap in one bound as it hunted for prey. On the top was a number of dead seagulls that had been uh, hunted and eaten. And so whatever it was, was big and, and very powerful and very athletic. It was, I think, the last place on earth you would expect to find any sort of wild animal. Bell discovered a network of tunnels on the site where he suspected the beast might have its lair. Going into an animal's den is, is obviously very frightening, especially when you don't know what's there.
was perhaps four feet square running maybe 20, 25 yards back. And it really was dark and a bit like going potholding. I was going in the only way in or out. And if anything was at the other end, the only way out was to come past me. So it, w it was a little bit worrying. Bell's courage paid off. In the dust lining the tunnel floor, he found the tracks of a large animal. They were big enough that you would think, well, I hope there's nothing at the end of this tunnel if I go in to have a look around. These are the actual prints found by Bell in 1986, but he had to wait seven years for the next hard evidence of the beast stalking Durham. In September 1993, the village of Walton had an unwelcome visitor, and this time it was after bigger prey. We were in bed, it was about half past one in the morning. Not quite asleep, as you know, and the security lights came on. So I immediately had a look out of the window and stayed there for two or three minutes and couldn't see anything. The dogs weren't barking, so I thought there's nothing really untoward, so went back to bed. <coughs> One of the three quarter grown lambs in the paddock next door had been very effectively slaughtered and just about wholly eaten. This was not the kind of sheep kill local farmers had ever seen before. There was no sign of any blood on the, on the grass. And I thought it was a bit, a bit strange because I'd never seen a sheep where it before in them circumstances. Usually there's a lot of blood about and... But in this case there wasn't any. I've seen plenty of dog worry and having worked as a policeman in a... a sheep area for a long time and it was completely different to any of the dog worryings I've ever been to. But this time the beast had left behind a series of clues to its identity. First there was the sheep's carcass. It was a very very clean kill, there was no sign of blood, there was no chewed bones, um, there was actually um, sort of raspings of flesh on the fleece as if something like a cat had licked the, the meat from the the, the actual animal. Next came an unusual paw print found on the edge of the village. This was examined by scenes of crime officer Ian Wilkinson. It was a fairly big print which was unusual for this area and the actual print that was made in the soil was quite firm, it was quite noticeable. So that struck me um, straight off. Wilkinson took this cast of the print it was clear from this that they were dealing with a big cat, something approaching the size of a lion. Finally, there were the droppings found beside the carcass. These were sent to an expert for analysis. It was actually positively identified as the dropping of, of a large cat. Um, the exact words were, which I'll never forget, were had I found it on the Serengeti, I would have said it was from a leopard, but I would suspect that it's actually from something like a puma. The cast made by Ian Wilkinson was checked against this one, taken from a puma in a zoo. They were a close match. The puma lives in a very, very wide variety of habitats, ranging from high mountains down to rainforest and dry deserts. There's absolutely no reason that such a superbly adaptive animal couldn't exist in moorland and whatever we have to offer here in Durham. But if a puma could survive in the British countryside, how did it get there in the first place? Today, there are strict controls on the ownership of exotic pets, but this wasn't always the case. You could phone up Harrods and order a panther or an anaconda to keep as a pet, as long as you had the money to pay for it. But in 1976, the Wild Animals Act came into force, and that required the keeping of animals under much more secure conditions. And rather than have their pets put down or transfer them to a zoo, it's likely that they actually release them into the wild. There is no official acknowledgement of the Durham Puma. The carcass from the Walton sheep kill was sent to the Ministry of Agriculture for post-mortem. But even as a police officer, Eddie Bell was not allowed to see the Ministry's report. But Eddie Bell doesn't need the Ministry's say-so. He's got the evidence of his own eyes. It was Christmas Eve, um, which is why I remember it. I was due back at work at two. 
I was coming home, it was a very frosty night, I was fairly tired. I was looking forward to getting home because I was frozen stiff. And I was about two miles from home, and ahead of me in the headlights, I actually saw the reflected eyes of an animal. What's that? What is it? It's not a deer. It can't be a fox. And as I came up on it and I got a better view in the headlights, it was a puma sat at the roadside. It is. It's a cat. I stopped maybe five yards past it and I got out the car and it was still at the roadside, although by then it had realised I'd stopped and it had got up and it had started off away from me and it went through a hedge and across a ploughed field. Um, and I, I watched it go and I, I really felt I wanted to go after it, but there was nothing I could do. I had no camera, no torch, um, nothing to record it with. And, and at the end of the day, there was nothing I could have done even if I'd caught it. So I marked the position where I saw it with a, a, a stick and I continued home and I went to bed. And I remember waking up and thinking, I've just had the strangest dream. I must have been really tired. And then it, I thought, no, it wasn't a dream. I, I did see what I saw. And I got in the car and I went straight back down the hill and there was the stick where I'd left it. And I knew then that I hadn't actually dreamt it. I had actually seen a puma. Pumas live for around 15 years. The first sighting was reported in 1986, so if there is one at large, it might not be around for much longer, and the sighting should stop soon. Unless, of course, there's a pair of them breeding out there. Good night. Uh...